Um, welcome back um, to the final closing panel um, of the Asia Pacific Forest Governance Forum. Um, a warm welcome to everybody, and I hope you had a good a good break and uh, that we everyone is back and uh, at their seats again. Um, this is, as, as um, hopefully most of you know, as you've joined us from the, the previous two hour session we just held, this is the final session of our four day forum um, being held as part of, the, of this um, our wider Asia Pacific forest governance project, which is aimed at strengthening non-state actor engagement in forest policy processes in Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines and Papua New Guinea. Um, my name is Noelle Kumpel. I'm head of policy at BirdLife International. Uh, BirdLife is the world's largest nature conservation partnership. Um, we, we always struggle to keep track of the number of partners, but we're currently 118 partners in 115 countries around the world. Um, and three of those are part of, our, of the project I just mentioned. This session is going to fo focus on key messages from the forum and the way forward for the next decade. Um, Though I also like to remind you that of what we set out to look at during the course of the forum in the opening session, which is the role of inclusive and effective forest governance in achieving an equitable carbon neutral and nature positive future. So now we're going to bring things back up from the local up to the global scale um, to see how what we've discussed um, applies to, to these wider um, climate, nature and, and people global, um, global goals. So just some quick housekeeping points. We're mainly going to have a panel discussion, but if you've got questions, as before, please put them in the, the Q&A and um, we can try to answer them as we go along. And then we'll also bring those into our report back from the, from the, the overall forum. So do put comments or questions in there. Um, and the session's being recorded. It will be made available on the CIDT um, and BirdLife YouTube and websites. Um, and it's uh, uh, there is simultaneous interpretation to French and Bahasa if you if you'd like to use that the functions at the bottom as well. And for the social media, we've got the hashtag FGF Asia Pacific. So just to remind you about the original aims of the forum was to provide a platform, space, and voice for non-state actors of different kinds, so indigenous peoples and local communities, community-based organisations, NGOs, and the private sector who are involved in forest conservation, monitoring and governance, and then to share key insights, learnings, experience, expertise on achieving equitable and effective forest governance, as well as some of the, and this is quite important, some of the challenges and complexities. And we want to obviously be honest about, uh, about these experiences in that context. And then to help influence policymakers, governments and donors um, on these topics, particularly in proximity to the key up -globing, uh, upcoming global meetings on climate and nature. So it, next month we have the high level opening of the UN Convention on Biodi Biological Diversity's COP15, uh, where we're coming to the end of negotiations on the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. And then in November, a uh, month from now, we have the UN Climate Change Convention's COP26. So those are just two key meetings that are coming up right now. And this closing panel aims to review what we've learned over the past four days of the forum uh, from the variety of technical sessions that we've had. And, and those covered a session on thinking global, acting local, how non-state actors support improved forest governance to translate global goals into real change on the ground, sharing know-how and experience on forest monitoring from the latest scientific tools to community-based monitoring and how to connect the two and the role, the role of different sorts of non-state actors in supporting forest policy processes, in particular Red Plus and Flag T, uh, and the role, um, particularly on that latter one, of, of um, support from the European Union, which is a donor to the project. And just now, we've been looking at how we sustain change for the coming decade, um, with some really great presentations that, we, that many of you have just, just seen. So now we're going to look at what all those presentations and discussions tell us in terms of the way forward for forest governance for the coming decade, in terms of supporting wider 2030 goals on climate, biodiversity and sustainable development. So you can see in front of you our wonderful selection of panelists who I'm going to introduce uh, to you. They're not in the right order on my screen, so I'll, I'll kind of introduce them um, as, as we'll go through in the panel. So firstly, we've got uh, Maria um, Belinda de la Paz, also known to us as Beachy, that's how I'm going to call you, um, as, who is the Chief Operating Officer from Haribon Foundation in the Philippines. 
Um, and uh, as you'll know by now, if you've been following the forum, the Haribon Foundation is a key partner in our forest governance project. And a huge, and Beachy herself is a hugely valued colleague, both on that and for bird life more widely. Then we've got Ms. Uh, uh, Ms. Inda um, Budiani, Budiani, who's the executive director from the Indonesian Business Council for Sustainable Development uh, in Indonesia. And we're really pleased to have you here to give us a perspective from the private sector on the panel. Thank you. Then we've got Josefa Kalino Tauli, um, also known as Sefa, um, who's an Ibaloi, I'm going to get this uh, sort of pronounced wrong, Ibaloi Kankane Igorot, Indigenous Youth from the Cordillera in the Philippines. And she's a member of the steering committee and the policy, um, policy coordinator of the Global Youth Biodiversity Network, which is the international youth coordination platform and constituency to the, to the Convention on Biological Diversity. And she also serves as co-chair of Youth for Territories of Life, which is a youth group of the Indigenous and Community Conserved Areas Consortium. Then we have Dr. Alison Hoare, who's Senior Research Fellow at Chatham House in the UK, which is a, a think tank um, very focused on these issues. Um, she has expertise in international forestry policy, forest governance and natural resource use and trade. Um, and has previously worked with a range of other environmental and forestry organisations undertaking research, policy analysis and project management. And then finally, we have um, Ed, D Edward Davey, um, advisor to the, currently advisor to the UK's um, uh, UN Climate Change COP26 Presidency's Nature Campaign, um, and also um, uh, to the Secretariat of the UN Food Systems Summit. Um, and he's International Engagement Director of the Food and Land Use Coalition, FOLU, and Co-Director of the World Resources Institute in the UK. Uh, and prior to joining WRI, Ed um, was Senior Pro Programme Manager at the Prince of Wales's International Sustainability Unit, uh, where he co-led a number of international initi initiatives on Red Plus, um, Zero Deforestation, commodity supply chains, landscape, forest landscape restoration and climate change, and before that served as lead advisor in environment to the Colombian presidency. So welcome to you all. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, and so we're just going to have a, a couple of, uh, a bit of a panel discussion, a couple of questions to all of you in two, so in two rounds, um, uh, and around about half an hour for that. So unfortunately, I haven't given them much time for any of these answers. Um, so I'm going to leave, probably leave you hanging, um, but let's try to stick to some really key points on this um, uh, and a sort of round up of some of the key messages. So if I start with Beachy, uh, Maria Belinda. Um, so as a core NGO member on our Asia Pacific Forest Governance Project, as I mentioned, um, what are some of the key lessons you've learned from the wealth of presentations and discussions over the past four days? So we've got Peachy Prime to give us a quick summary for those of you who, were, who were, those of you who weren't here. Over to you, Peachy. Yes. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay. So uh, thank you, Noel. Harriman is proud to be part of the Forest Governance Project. This project has come a long way from five years ago, as we have seen from the partner presentations in the past three days. More than the sharing of our accomplishments, it is equally satisfying to learn other initiatives shared by our friends in conservation. There are two key lessons I take with me. First is the increasing availability of technology for local stakeholders, such as mapping tools that already penetrate deep into the forests. It is able to reach far-flung areas, providing key information that allows local stakeholders to make informed decisions. But not only is that technology available, but how it is applied. Many have shared that they have given emphasis on local knowledge and participation in its use that brings about an increased awareness of local communities realms into the larger KBA forests in the country. The forum only, uh, number two, the forum uh, only shows the diversity of roles taken by civil society and the basis of their interest, capacity, political situation towards effective forest governance. There's also keen attention given to supporting mandates of government institutions while ensuring continuous engagement with different stakeholders through dialogues, the use of data, and developing trust. This forum reiterates the need for cooperation among all sectors um, to sustain efforts in keeping our forests standing. I believe that each one's role is important, and as we say in Haribon, we are all forest guardians. 
Fantastic. Thank you very much, Beachy. Um, so the next question is um, is for Inda. Um, and they've just to ask you, what do you think are some of the challenges and ways forward for the private sector in terms of improving forest governance in the region and also engaging with non-state actors to do so? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Noel, for the question. Uh, but first of all, thank you for the invitation. Very honor for me to be here. So now answering your question, I think there are some ways of business to improve the forest governance nowadays. For example, is certification. Nowadays, that business gets certification showing that there are also support the improvement of forest governance. Uh, we know PFC and FSC, and you know that there is a growing uh, number. Uh, I think for PFC, there is uh, 20,000 companies and organizations have achieved PFC chain of custody certification, as well with FSC. I think uh, the number of business receiving FSC chain of custody certificate has been growing rapidly. Uh, in Asia Pacific, yeah? especially in China. And also uh, traceability. I think this also becomes the issue for sustainability. In Indonesia, we have SVLK, Timber Legality Assurance System, that serves to ensure timber products and raw materials obtained uh, or derived from sources that its origins and management meet the legal aspect it will risk, uh, the legal aspect. So I think it will risk the business itself if the company give false information to public because now we have methodology to ensure that the company use a sustainable material. For example, IBCSD also promotes sustainability policy transparency toolkit, uh, which is SPOT. Maybe you have heard about this. Uh, these tools support sustainable commodity production and trade. So this uh, support timber transparency because it assess timber and pulp producer, processor, and also traders on their public disclosure regarding their organization policies, practices related to ASG. And also maybe you have heard about jurisdictional approaches. So IBCSD working with TFA on this issue. So this is also the, been the topic in sustainability. This is the approach that also adopted by some business for the successful transition for sustainable development across an entire political geography. Yeah. So now the challenge, I think the challenge is that the practice of forestry is increasing in complexity at economic, operational, environmental, and also social scales. So on environmental, for example, the planted forests are perceived to be the future of the timber industry, but they face intense competition for land and investment in other crops. So this may relate with biodiversity issue. And social, for example, there is a land tenure issue and ownership. This can relate with historical background of the land, level of welfare of the community in surrounding area, and also uh, lack of communication that can lead to conflict. So this is also the challenge. So for governance, the bureaucracy within the company is also the challenge. Uh, sometimes the company not see sustainability as the whole approach, but only separate uh, topic. So in terms of engaging non-state actor, I see more and more private sector engage in non-state actor like NGO. So I think there is some uh, reason why companies and NGO engaging in partnership. Uh, I think the top three is because the reputation and credibility, innovation and long-term stability and impact. So uh, the good thing is that the engagement is not only with the large company, but also in supply chain level. So I think this is beneficial for new market building in, in company perspective. So as the challenge in the partnership is the credibility of the NGO itself, whether the NGO or the non-state actor is accepted by other stakeholders. So that this is very important for the private sector to mitigate the risk of uh, this collaboration. I stop here, thank you, Noel. Thank you, that was that was excellent range of points there and, and, and so many of which have been sort of mentioned already, but many new ones there as well. So it's really, really helpful. Thank you. Um, so next to turn to Josefa um, to ask you, how can youth and in particular indigenous youth help to improve forest governance and what are the barriers and opportunities to help them do so? Thank you, Noel. And um, thank you for the opportunity also to join you um, on this closing panel of the Forest Governance Forum. Um, the topic of forest governance is a very crucial one to many indigenous peoples, to many women, and also to many youth all around the world. Um, to indigenous peoples, it is so crucial that for many, um, the forest is 
it's very much tied to identity, um, to survival, um, and in many cases, it's life itself. Um, so how can young people help to improve forest governance? What I will say um, is that so many youth are already doing so. There are already so many youth and so many indigenous youth doing very important work on the ground um, and are at the forefront of forest stewardship. Um, for instance, in Apayao, here in the Cordillera, um, the Kabugao youth are leading campaigns um, against destructive dams that impact the river and the watershed. Um, there are young foresters doing community work um, who have a very strong sense of equity and are doing and are working um, in service of the communities um, that they are in partnership with. There are youth at um, the local, national, and global levels that are really advocating for better policies um, and that are working to engage in decision-making spaces despite the many challenges to do so. Um, this is something I see actively through the work um, uh, of the network I'm part of, for instance, the Global Youth Biodiversity Network. Um, these efforts, they, there are many of them. They are very significant. They are already ongoing um, and they need to be recognized and supported. Um, so what more can we do for indigenous youth? We can continue to um, learn from our elders um, and become practitioners of the sustainable traditional practices that we have. Um, for instance, in the Cordillera region here in the Philippines, again, um, there's a forest management system called the Lapat system um, practiced by the Isnag and the Tingyan of Abra. Um, through the Lapat system, um, extraction um, for over certain areas and for a certain time is prohibited in the community to allow for natural recovery of the forests. Um, there are many systems like this, um, not just, of course, in the Cordillera, but throughout the region and also um, in diverse communities all around the world. Um, on a related note, youth can, can kind of join the collective movement on the ground and in policy um, for equity and justice in forest governance, um, including, for instance, the crucial recognition of the, rec of the rights of indigenous peoples to lands and territories. And we can exercise our rights to participate in decision making. Um, there's really no doubt in my mind that um, with a strong youth voice, we we will have like more sustainable, more inclusive, more um, creative decisions um, that will benefit future generations far into the future. Um, there are unfortunately many barriers, for instance, for many indigenous youth who defend the environment. Um, many of them are being cr criminalized. Reports have shown that my country, the Philippines, is among uh, the deadliest places for environmental defenders, um, and there is a lack of way of ways to access justice. There's also a lack of access to culturally appropriate education. Um, and this is leading to the loss of our traditional knowledge and languages. Many young people are also having to migrate out of their ancestral lands for many different reasons. Um, and this is all in addition, of course, to other challenges faced by indigenous peoples, like the lack of uh, recognition and lack of land tenure. So these barriers need to be addressed and the sectors represented here in this forum um, all have the power to help with that in some way. Um, just one more short point. Um, for youth at large, it's quite important to discuss what meaningful engagement looks like. Um, unfortunately, many young people are still being tokenized and we need to take uh, more concrete steps towards meaningful and respectful youth engagement. Um, and I'll stop there. Thank you, Noel. Excellent. Thank you. That was uh, yeah, covered some really key important points and actually echoing some of the opening statement points there on on some of the challenges for in terms of access to justice and, and rights, etc. Um, so now moving over to across to Alison. Um, so just to ask you, in your decades of reviewing forest governance around the world, including through running the internationally renowned Chatham House Global Forest Governance Forum series, what do you think are the key challenges for Red Plus and Flag T in the coming decade, particularly for the Asia Pacific region, where the threats to forests are particularly acute, um, and and in terms of looking at how non-state actor engagement uh, can help? Quite a large question there, but I uh, <laughs> give you that challenge. Great, thanks, Noel, and many thanks for the for this opportunity. Indeed, it is a, a large question, so I'll give a fairly broad answer, perhaps. Um, so I think the the key challenges are, are political. You know, we live in a world of increasing uncertainty, 
as has been all too apparent from the COVID pandemic, as well as the extreme weather events and forest fires that have been seen in the Asia Pacific region and beyond. And so in a, in a context of uncertainty and in particular economic uncertainty, it can be difficult to persuade governments and the electorate not to take what seems like the easy route of, of trying to boost short-term economic growth. Um, and this is a route that is being taken in many countries. Um, and we're seeing weakening of environmental and social protections and uh, packages to, to boost production and consumption. But now more than ever, what is needed is, is careful deliberation of the best options for forests and for land use and to, to try and find ways that are equitable and environmentally sustainable and will help tackle poverty. So this will require engagement with all stakeholders, um, <clears throat> which brings me to the, that, the latter part of your question of how engagement with non-state actors can help. Um, Non-state actors are, of course, a very diverse group, um, as we've as you said, you know, they include rural and urban communities, indigenous peoples, private sector. But this means that they also have a, a diversity of knowledge and skills and expertise. Um, and so this is a, a fantastic resource for governments. Um, they provide a means of, for increasing capacity and capabilities of governments who are often very constrained themselves by limited resources. Um, and this has been seen in the area of forest enforcement, as we've been hearing over the last few days with um, the involvement of civil society and forest monitoring. Um, but it's also much, much broader than that, that non-state actors have a very important role to play in helping to shape the future direction of forests and land use. Um, as Josepha just very eloquently put it, you know, there's this huge potential within non-state actors and in particular indigenous peoples that have um, wealth of skills, wealth of ideas, and so can really have an important role to help in um, developing and implementing alternative models for development and developing innovative approaches to, to forest governance. So this does require on the part of those non-state actors to have well-developed ideas, backed up with evidence, to have the skills and expertise to be able to make the case for these. And of course, it also requires an openness on the part of government to be able to or to be willing to work in partnership with, with non-state actors. But I think there are some really exciting and um, positive examples of that starting to happen. So hopefully we'll see more of that in the coming years. Fantastic, thank you. Yeah, that, and that, those are really good points building up, building off um, of Josepha's. So really, really helpful there. Thank you, Alison. Um, so now finally over to Ed um, to ask you another mega question. Um, but uh, look, given that strengthening forest governance and define, designing um, effective strategies has the potential to develop a global forest restoration movement, which aligns with achieving the climate targets of the Paris Agreement, the Sustainable Development Goals, and the proposed targets of the Global Biodiversity Framework that I mentioned. Um, we need all those things to come together to support an equitable, carbon neutral, nature positive future. But how do we ensure um, uh, the necessary synergies between forest policies and processes and action uh, and action on nature and climate change? Um, and for you, as in your role as, as, uh, as uh, advising the, on COP26, um, will this be on the agenda at the UN climate change um, COP26 in a month's time? <laughs> Thank you, Noel, and <laughs> greetings, <laughs> friends and colleagues. It was wonderful to hear hear you speak about the amazing work that you're doing on the ground, and it, it's always an honour and a joy to be with you. And great love and respect for BirdLife and all the wonderful work you do. Um, Noel, thank you for the opportunity. COP26, friends, I think is an amazing opportunity to land good work in this area. And the reason I say that is that 
the UK government is very clear that this is a nature COP. It's a COP where the role of nature in mitigating climate change, but also in helping the world to adapt to the changing climate that's already underway, is being given somehow more prominence in the agenda than certainly I can remember ever before. Um, for example, you know, on the first and second day of the COP, when 130 world leaders are expected in Glasgow, this is the single biggest meeting of world leaders in person since the pandemic began. And there is a whole three hour session on nature with heads of state expected to speak and to talk about their plans for nature protection, nature restoration, nature recovery. And for example, the, the, the UK uh, Prime Minister has invited President Jokowi of Indonesia to co-host that meeting with him because of Indonesia's and the President's leadership on nature protection with reduced deforestation in Indonesia. Uh, and yesterday, I think more commitments on mangrove protections and restoration. Uh, but also there are invitations to the other countries represented here today. And every country has been asked to come to COP with ambitious nature plans and commitments. Those include a commitment to a potential World Leaders Summit declaration, uh, which would uh, see countries making commitments to nature protection and restoration, to better agriculture, to increased finance for the natural world. Uh, there's a commitment anticipated on the Forest Agriculture and Commodity Trade Dialogue, which involves 30 countries over the last year working together to try to come to a new agreement about how countries that are producing tropical forest commodities, uh, agricultural commodities can be rewarded for more sustainable practice. And in return, consumer countries get access to sustainably produced commodities that are better for local people and also better for the environment. Uh, there's a statement foreseen on agricultural policy and you know, how, how to reform or repurpose or redirect agricultural policies and subsidies and systems uh, to deliver better outcomes for people, for climate, for health and the environment. Uh, we also anticipate at the COP lots of work on indigenous peoples, their rights, their rights to their land, land tenure, you know, good governance. How do we support forest communities, indigenous peoples to uphold and respect and, and safeguard their rights to their land? We also anticipate statements on, on what public government money can do to support these objectives and also what global flows of finance can do from institutional investors and from banks and pension funds and the like. So in summary, and of course, we expect governments to come to the COP with, with strong NDCs, nationally determined commitments, which are good on the environment and good on land use and on the ocean. So I think in summary, you know, there's a lot to play for from the point of view of policy at the national level at COP26. But of course, the most important thing is what's happening on the ground in, in the ecosystems that matter. And I think that's where the work that you and the network is doing is so powerful. Back to you, Noel. Thank you. No, that was fantastic to, to give us that suite of activity happening there at the COP. And indeed, exactly what we want to be thinking about here is, is how is our work relevant to that? And I think that's very, very clear from what you've just said. Um, so yeah, we haven't got long um, rattling through. Um, so it's kind of, um, I'm gonna to attempt to bring these things together in a bit, but um, for you guys now, just one to two minutes each and the same question to everybody, um, given the proximity to those key upcoming global meetings on climate and nature we've mentioned, and what you've just heard about what the, the, op the opportunities for COP26, um, from your particular perspective, what key message would you like to send to policymakers, governments, and or donors regarding the role of forest governance in contributing to an equitable, carbon neutral, nature positive future in the Asia Pacific region and beyond? So just a minute or two each, just to sort of think about a last take home point for us to consider. And if we go in the same order, just to start with you, Beachy. For me, uh, policymakers need to support policies that clearly, clearly define how countries develop in light of today's environmental crisis, beginning today. 
we can no longer put off legislation for the next generation to enact in order to solve today's problems. This generation needs to commit and take action towards solving today's problems. Excellent, super, that was certainly to time. <laughs> so um, over then to you, Inda, for your key point. Okay, so I think the role of forest governance in contributing to an equitable carbon neutral natural positive future in everywhere, not only in Asia Pacific region is obviously very important. So looking from the private sector perspective, everything that comes from forests needs to be ensured of the sustainability of the raw material of the resources itself. And it can also relate with water availability, soil management and so many things. And without this, the business will collapse. Yeah, And even for non-forest uh, sector business, such as from agriculture to transportation, they also need the supportive climate regulations, a good climate. And I also believe societies also need a good climate regulation. And forest definitely plays important role in this because forests give livelihood. So my key message from business perspective is we need to join action to help the forest sector navigate the tremendous challenge that lie ahead and ensure that this industry continues to grow. Fantastic, thank you. And then so over to you, Josefa, for your next in line for your thoughts. Uh, thank you. First of all, a very key message I would send um, is that we need to recognize and respect um, the central role of indigenous peoples and local communities in sustaining forests, um, and that these very significant contributions extend far beyond the territories in which they live. Indigenous peoples and local communities are leaders, are very central actors in forest governance, and they need to be recognized as such. Um, and more broadly, forest governance should take a human rights-based approach um, and should work to secure indigenous lands and territories and for indigenous peoples to govern them on their own terms. Um, with the ongoing process of the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework, as you mentioned, Noel, um, there are growing calls um, it's, it's ongoing and we are being or we are involved in this process. In this context, there are growing calls to vastly expand areas under protection and conservation. Um, and in this context, it will be very crucial to ensure safeguards and um, prevent human rights violations uh, as mainstream conservation has had um, a historical legacy of unjust evictions of communities. Um, and to be successful in area-based conservation, a key strategy should really be to recognize um, these areas that are being conserved by indigenous peoples and local communities, which are sometimes called ICCAs, um, alongside pushing for more effective and more equitable protected areas and um, supporting other effective area-based conservation measures, um, or OECMs, as sometimes abbreviated. Um, in other words, we do need to embed and uphold human rights and policies. Uh, moreover, we need to ensure gender equality, gender responsiveness, um, as women are also disproportionately uh, impacted. Um, and in line with this, we need to make funding directly available and accessible to the communities themselves. Um, and another point is that, as I touched upon earlier, we need to engage youth meaningfully in a very accessible and safe um, and empowering respectful way um, when it comes to forest governance. This means, for instance, supporting youth-led projects um, because youth are not just recipients. We are also able to lead our own initiatives. Um, it, makes, uh, it means making an effort to reach diverse youth and it means enabling youth to participate um, fully and effectively in decision-making processes because we will be the ones living through the outcomes of the decisions being made today. Um, and finally, um, the issue of forest governance is very much embedded in a bigger picture. Um, and we need to collectively be working to address the root causes of biodiversity loss um, and the social inequalities in which um, biodiversity loss is also rooted. Um, yeah, I'll stop there. Thank you. Fantastic. Yeah, so it's a really good range of a good summary there of some of the, uh, the real key points we need to consider. Um, over to you, Zen Alison, for a, a few last reflections. Yes, I think my main message would be that we do need to make sure that we don't just focus on targets and we go beyond targets. Um, you know, experience has shown that it's all too easy to set targets, whether for stopping deforestation or um, 
conserving a certain proportion of the land or committing a certain amount of finance. Um, but the, the big challenge lies in actually making these targets become reality. And it's difficult because this requires changing current systems and ways of doing things. So, you know, as I touched on earlier, a big part of achieving, achieving this is through changing the way that decisions are, are made. And so I would close by saying my key message to policymakers and to governments are that they need to be more open and transparent, not just in terms of sharing data and information, but also in how they make their decisions. So they need to see civil society as, as partners. And the message to donors is a simple one that they need to provide the finance to help make this happen. Thank you, Alison. Yes, very good points there at the end. <laughs> Glad you said that. Um, and uh, then finally, over to you, Ed, um, for your last thoughts. Thank you, Noel. And um, I, I see a question from uh, Habiba Mohammed about how you raise funding sustainably for independent forest monitoring. And I think that uh, that comes to Alison's point about more donor money being on the table uh, to support that kind of work, but also national government funding. You know, uh, it's in a government's self-interest, I would argue, for there to be good independent forest monitoring. Um, so a combination of national sources and global ones, I would argue, are needed. Um, concluding thoughts from me, Noel. Um, I agree with, with what everyone has said. Uh, I was very taken, uh, Josepha, by your remarks. Um, and I hope that uh, you're engaging with the COP26 process and, and colleagues. And if you're not, do do let me know. We'd, we'd like to hear more from all of you. Um, I think three thoughts from my side. The first is, you know, how, how do we get heads of state to really speak to this agenda and, and own it in some way? How do we touch the hearts, not just the minds, but the hearts of, of heads of government about nature? And I think uh, the COP26 is one opportunity to do that at the World Leaders Summit. Um, there will be some quite moving you know, video installations from good work happening on the ground and voices from all of your countries there. Um, but I think we need as a community to get better at reaching heads of government about the importance of nature. The second point is, it's not all about national governments. You know, there are much more influential voices in the world beyond national governments, whether it's heads of companies or people in public life, celebrities and the like, uh, but also, um, you know, movements, you know, unions and um, sectors. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot to be done to, to build a broader movement for change. Um, and I think, uh, you know, we, we, we as a community could do more to mobilize a broader um, set of actors in support of our objectives. Uh, but then the third and last point from me is that Whilst we try to shift the world in a better direction and use processes like COP26 to do that, um, you know, perhaps the most important thing we can do right now is, is work on the ground in the places that matter and uh, work in partnership with local communities on the front line. Um, and I think it's in that context, therefore, that um, the work that um, you and your networks do is just so incredibly important. And uh, the responsibility of all of us is to get behind that work on the ground and support you. Back to you, Noelle. That was fantastic. Um, really, really helpful and insightful comments and picking up on the threads of our discussions um, uh, and, and much more bringing in some, some, some new and important areas, which I'm pleased we've managed to touch on here. Um, I think I'm going to have to apologise that with the, you know, the very limited time we have in this session, um, I haven't been monitoring the, the Q&A, um, but I'd also urge you guys, whilst I talk for a little bit, um, if there's so, there's um, comments and questions in the in the chat there, in the Q&A function, to have a little look at that. And if there's anything you can address, please have a look in there. Um, we won't be able to sort of have another round taking questions verbally. So. Um, apologies, that was a little bit um, uh, pre-planned, um, but do, if you want to kind of interact a bit more, please use the, the Q&A function for the last few minutes of the session. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to try to sort of um, summarise some of what was just said, as well as the entire forum, 
which is a bit of a tall order. Um, uh, it, it, yeah, but it's so much has, has come through from it. So just to, I mean, on my, from my side, as we started the forum, some of you might have been wondering what, and we've been mentioning it here now, what the an equitable carbon neutral nature positive future really means and, and how that's relevant uh, is in that bit beyond the remit of this forum. Um, I hope, and I think we've shown how the experiences and learning on the ground, both positive and negative, are absolutely critical to achieving these, these big global goals. Um, I mentioned that I head up BirdLife's global policy team based in Cambridge, um, and a key part of our work is, is, is engaging with these global conventions and policy processes like the CBD, the UNFCCC, and increasingly mechanisms like the High Level Political Forum on Sustainable Development and the Human Rights Council, again, ones which are often a bit out of the reach of, of some of our, our kind of, some, some people on the ground, I guess. Um, so while we work closely with BirdLife partners to advocate improved policies and support implementation of those processes, um, both at the global and, and national levels, and we try to learn experience, learn from those experiences on the ground, there can see, still seem to be a real disconnect. Um, and uh, for, for many others on the ground, without that wider perspective and reach, uh, a struggle to kind of understand that local, local to global approach, and it's therefore much more challenging. So I think that's why this forum, um, and as many of you have sort of said in the chat as we've been going through for the past few days, um, has been so important in sort of trying to bridge that gap. Um, we've had an enormously rich and insightful range of presentations and discussions over the course of the past few four days. And thank you all for that, um, both presenters and participants. And there's a lot for us to learn from that and take into account in the upcoming global negotiations and conversations um, uh, as, as we can see. So just to summarize a few of the key points that have come out of those discussions and just now, and, and um, I might try and flag a few people, but apologies for only pulling out a few examples uh, in terms of a lot to, to pull out quickly. Because um, we, we started up with a reminder that the forests in, in, uh, so in the Asia Pacific region, both forests and forest policies are fragmented, and we need to work to join both of those up. And that means action across society, linking up all sorts of non-state actors um, with governments and as well within government ministries as well. And it's important to understand the context. So while the majority of lands in Papua New Guinea, for example, are community managed, in Malaysia, they're predominantly state owned. So that means a very different role of non-state actors and a different process for, for tenure rights and the oversight of policy implementation in those different contexts. But so while it's important to understand that particular context and the different legal frameworks, there are a number of principles, needs and challenges that are, are clearly common in helping us to bridge this local to global gap. So firstly, partnerships are key. So those between non-state actors, including the private sector and with governments. And while we are uh, um, appreciating diversity, also looking at that um, commonality between us. There's a huge potential for improved technology. Um, we've heard about some of the global tools and platforms, uh, all the way down to phone apps on the ground. And as Beecha just mentioned, you know, making that connection is really key. And we've, we've, that's, that side of things is developing quickly into something we can use, um, we need to be building on over the next decade. Um, there are um, uh, a number of improved systems and processes to ensure transparency and accountability. But we've heard about some of the complexity and the kind of level of detail that's needed um, on that side. Um, the importance of starting small and ensuring we've got the right sort of technical support and then scaling that up um, was, was highlighted in particularly in the session just, just now. And the need to sustain commitment and support. Um, so, for example, we heard about some of the challenges with Flag T. Um, and that's quite a live discussion in, among, in, the, in the EU at the moment. Um, but, you know, clearly we need to learn from the challenges we've had, but continue and strengthen that. Um, and examples from Cambodia, for example, other places looking at where projects often take a long time to get established, but that, that sustained support is really critical um, for, for success. So in terms of the bigger picture, it's not just about targets, but implementation. I think that was made very clearly just now. Um, and the very start, we heard that a fifth of key biodiversity areas, so Ed just mentioned, you know, focusing on the important places and working with pe people to that end, 
A fifth of key biodiversity areas fall within indigenous people's lands. And we've got major overlaps there with high carbon areas. So conserving those lands with and for people, local people serves multiple goals at both local, but also global scales. And that's important in the context of these proposed targets to expand protected and conserved areas under the global biodiversity framework, which need to be much more, need to be um, equitable, but therefore will be more effective. Um, so that's that's something to definitely be thinking about as we test this new um, OECM approach that uh, Sepa mentioned, um, as we expand, uh, well, the, the likely um, target to expand protected and conserved areas to 30% of the planet. And um, we need to take a landscape approach, providing economic benefits while buffering key biodiversity areas and sustaining ecosystem services that are critical for, for people and business. Um, we also heard some, exp some experiences from Central Africa, um, which highlights the global and intercontinental aspect to, to things like illegal logging and illegal wildlife trade, um, and also um, looking at addressing more, the root causes of nature loss, so some of the bigger picture stuff. And where indigenous people's rights are not legally recognized, deforestation is much higher. And indigenous peoples are being displaced or, de or criminalized. So we need access to legal course, uh, recourse and, um, and justice. Um, and where relevant strength and land tenure, which we didn't talk too much about, but it's definitely something, to, you know, one, one, uh, one thing to, to be um, th considering, as well as technical support and funding where necessary to, to local, uh, indigenous people and local communities on the ground. For youth, we need to ensure meaningful engagement and recognise the role, their role in shaping and implementing in alternative models of development and forest governance. Um, and just sort of touching on uh, something we also haven't mentioned, but actually of relevance in this global arena right now, um, the BirdLife Partnership, along with uh, around 1,300 other civil society organisations, is calling for the UN to recognise the universal right to a healthy environment. Um, we've got a, a a campaign called One Planet, One Right on that. Um, but there's right now the Human Rights Council are about to table this resolution um, at its, in, in the session, the uh, 48th century session right now. And this, if passed, would provide a really a strengthened human rights basis for forest governance. So actually, this is a really important uh, and could be quite transformational um, change in terms of human rights um, uh, um, it, um, aspects to, to this work. Then we talked about the private sector, which uh, needs to be part of the solution. It has the power and both and the need to do better as it has risks to business, if not, we just heard. Um, and in the open session, we heard about the new tropical timber accord, being, uh, which is gonna be launched at COP26 to provoke, promote forest governance within an international framework. Um, we've also heard about increasing certification and transparency. Um, for example, the spot tool and, and how to, and engaging with um, local, the need to, for businesses to engage with local stakeholders. And we did, we've we talked just now actually about the context of COVID, which we shouldn't forget about, the need to ensure that governments don't take shortcuts uh, in, in building back um, and that they really support a truly green, just recovery um, and not taking those shortcuts that um, Alison mentioned. Um, Governments need to be more open and transparent, um, and donors need to support that. But both thinking of finance at not just at the global level, but also national level and government finance. So basically, um, for me, I think it's been absolutely the fundamental you know, uh, lesson from this, this forum has been the importance of sharing all these lessons between ourselves, but also taking that uh, forward to donors and governments. Um, so um, underscoring the importance of this, this forum to make sure all of your voices are heard. Um, and I do think it was great to bring Sephra at the end here because I think a final and really important perspective from youth here, because ultimately the decisions we're making now will be critical for their future. So thank you all very much. That was a <laughs> second long time. I, I haven't really covered half of what we talked about, but um, uh, apologies, I've missed some critical elements out, but um, uh, yeah, um, a, a lot, a lot to consider um, across the course of um, of the session. So now, um, it's um, I'm going to hand over to um, Hum Gurung, who's the manager of the Asia Pacific Forest Governance Project um, here at BirdLife, um, and also part of our Asia Regional Office. 
um, to um, give a few closing remarks from our side. Over to you, Hun. Uh, Mr. Oswald uh, Brecken, uh, Deputy CEO of Shadow Forest Corporation. Uh, distinguished panel members, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening. First of all, I would like to thank all participants who have attended the four day event and shared their experience and insights on forest governance and in the Asia Pacific region and internationally. About 625 people have spent over 10 hours in the, in the last four days, learning and sharing about better forest governance, forest monitoring and the empowerment of local and indigenous people in forest management and governance. As Noel had just mentioned, now with 22 technical presentation and two high level panel discussions, would like to thank all the you know, session chairs, experts and presenters. On behalf of BirdLife International, as the project lead, I'd like to thank CIDT, in particular, my colleague, Richard, Danny, Habiba, Russell, and Nicole, who have coordinated and supported at this forum so well. The forum has benefited from the interpretation skills of Margaretha and Bashir for Basha, English, English, Basha, and Andrew and Havini for French, English, English, French. Thank you so much. Thanks to our project partners, uh, Burung Indonesia, Malaysian Nature Society, Haribon Foundation, Ken Kelly Conservation Alliance, and the University of Papua New Guinea for the smooth coordination and contributions. Also thanks to my bird life team, Oshendra, Jonathan, Daniel, and Nitu, uh, also Noel and Bena for the support and guidance. The inputs and the contribution we have received from inter international experts in forest conservation, policy and advocacy are of great value for the forest governance project and which will help shape and form strong outcomes for us to report. This week provide, has provided an important space for discussing, debating and sharing knowledge on effective forest governance principles in the SA Pacific region and beyond. We have heard from non-state actors of all kinds representatives from government, the private sector, NGOs and advocates for local community and indigenous people's rights. The first technical you know, session on day one explored both you know, global, regional and local approaches in improving forest governance, biodiversity conservation and climate change mitigation. The second uh, you know, session focused on the value of scientific tools and data sets together with monitoring on the ground for improving transparency and accountability and drive effective forest governance. Knowledge was shared on GIS-based you know, mapping tools for identifying forest loss, app-based tools that empower local people as forest guardians and connecting large data sets with monitoring on the ground. On day three, our focus shifted to exploring how to bridge the gap between public and private interests for effective governance. We were reminded of the important role of indigenous peoples who play in forest monitoring and heard how the private sector contributes to conservation action locally and explore the value and changes of forest law enforcement. Finally, today we have just you know, considered how the tools, resources and relationships found within the forest governance system can be sustained for the coming decade and how it can help meet the wider environmental targets we face. Ultimately, the ACF Pacific Forest Governance uh, Forum has brought together a great variety of different voices involved and associated with forest governance. We have tried to better understand how together we can achieve fairer, more sustainable and more effective forest governance. The ACF Pacific Forest Governance Forum has been held in the spirit of questioning, discussion, debate, and collaboration. If we all take the spirit of this event forward into our own work and lives, we stand the best chance of achieving a truly sustainable and 
effective approach to forest governance in Asia Pacific and internationally. Last but not least, I would like to extend special thanks to Mr. Daniel Ajich, Minister, Councillor, and Head of Cooperation, European Union Delegation to Thailand for delivering the opening remarks. I'm also privileged to welcome uh, Mr. Oswald Bracken Tyson for joining us for the closing session of the forum. To you all, please stay safe and well. Thank you. Ribakasi, Salamat, then you too. Thank you very much. Um, um, and now, off, um, uh, for, I would like to um, introduce uh, for, for some, some final closing remarks, Mr. Oswald Bracken Tizen, who's the um, Deputy CEO uh, from the Management and Conservation Division of the Sarawak Forestry Corporation in Malaysia. Uh, Bracken holds a ma Master of Parks, Recreation and Tourism Management from Lincoln University, New Zealand. Uh, and is a member of the ICM World Commission on Protected Areas and the Crocodile Specialist Group, as well as the Institute Foresters in uh, Malaysia. Um, and he's going to give us uh, a, a, some closing remarks on behalf of the Malaysia government. Thank you very much and over to you, Bracken. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, distinguished uh, panel members, ladies and gentlemen, very good morning, very good afternoon. Good evening to some of us in this part of the country of the world. Um, I would like to congratulate all the panel members for a very inspiring uh, session this afternoon. I listened to all of it with great interest. And of course, first of all, I would like to thank the Forest Government Forum Organizing Committee for inviting me to deliver, to deliver a closing remark on this first Asia Pacific Forest Government Forum. Um, I believe everybody knows that Asia Pacific is covered by 740 million hectares of forest, counting to 18% of the global forest. Um, the tropical forest of Asia Pacific is a lifeline of millions of people in this region and are the main contributor to national wealth in several nations, particularly in Malaysia, where it provides jobs, livelihood opportunities, and also Today, it is a destination for ecotourism. I'm one of the forest community where uh, forest to us as a forest community is in fact a supermarket. It provides us most of our need. And uh, anybody interested, we call it Tuan Torun. In short, Tuan is uh, Torun is nature. So it is uh, a way to respect the forest that provide for us uh, as a community. The tropical forest of Malaysia is in fact a treasure trough of biodiversity, putting the country up on the top 12 most diverse nation in this planet. Malaysia in fact uh, have a diverse uh, uh, landscape, including uh, you look at it, we have 55 IBAs, uh, which is recognized the nationary and Malaysia forest is in fact a state matter. The federal government in fact provide guidelines for the state, but land matters and forest is state matter. And uh, it is the state government that decide how to use it or how to manage it or to protect it. Um, <clears throat> in a way, um, the state agencies together with the local, the NGOs, community, manage the forest. Um, we in Sarawak, for example, uh, manage our own forest area. Um, the state government had put a pack in its uh, land use policy where at least 6 million hectares, we have 5 million hectares in Sarawak. Half of it is to be, to remain as permanent forest and at least 10% is to be totally protected. Uh, we subscribe to CBD targets. Of course, if you look at 10%, it's not what RG target is, but uh, uh, we do um, look at other uh, OECM in order to achieve the world target upon us. Um, 
we have all the very unique plant and animal. If you take a look, we have the largest flower in the world, the Rafflesia. We have the orangutan, the, the endangered orangutan. We also have uh, from the largest to the tiniest. Uh, recently, uh, the group of scientists from Singapore University who came up to Ranja Antimau, they described two new species of land crabs. And uh, this, the list goes on. So the concern is if we are not investigating and finding out uh, fast enough, we may lose something that we never know. So in Malaysia, <clears throat> um, as a nation, uh, Malaysia subscribed to all the international the agreement and, uh, and try to be uh, achieving all the targets. Um, we're looking at areas like in Peninsula Malaysia, the central the forest fine. And in Borneo, working with the other nations of Indonesia and Brunei, we put aside what is called as the heart of Borneo. We subscribe to, to REDD Plus and also try to make sure that uh, uh, we are getting toward uh, carbon trading and carbon credit in order to, to see that communities in the forest can also benefit from it. Malaysia is one of the Asia Pacific government uh, project country. And we have been working very closely in Sarawak. We have been working very closely with Malaysian Nature Society, which is uh, collaborating with bird life in Malaysia for many years. And under the Asia Pacific Forest Government Project, we have been actively involving uh, in the in in the, in in the project. For instance, in Sarawak, a few years back, uh, Sarawak Forestry, together with the Malaysian Nature Society, organized what is called as the Honorary Wildlife Ranger Program. And this program is, in fact, a voluntary program where the public or uh, NGOs would plead or subscribe or say that we would like to contribute to nature conservation. Uh, Sarawak Forestry would give them five days training to understand what it is what it takes to be volunteer honorary wildlife ranger and it is not an honor because uh, they are not paid uh, what i describe as the heart the head the heart and the hand a concept of you understand it you believe in it you have to promote it and these are the people which i call or which we call as uh, ambassadors to conservation they also work to become eyes and ears of uh, the government to help us to protect and to promote conservation. And we have seen some of the active ones who had uh, sacrificed their time and their own money to promote conservation. Uh, for example, in Lawas, uh, we used to have people who hunt and consume dugong, dugong, dugong. Uh, when we promote honorary wildlife ranger there, we can in fact see that they are the ones who actively support conservation of dugong and other species. And if any of the marine mammals and turtles get caught in their net, they will release it and report it back to our forestry, which is a good achievement. Anyway, um, Madam Chair, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank the European Union for supporting this project, uh, strengthening non-state actor involving in the forest government in Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, Papua New Guinea, uh, led by Birdless International and uh, partnered by Burong Indonesia, Malaysian Nature Society, Hebron Foundation, Philippine Tinker uh, Conservation Alliance, University of Papua New Guinea and Center for International Development Training. University of uh, Warhampton, UK. Um, I believe it was an exciting and productive four days event and participated uh, and participants have learned and shared important, uh, important transparency and accountability in forest sector and forest government and, and, and uh, impact on livelihood. So our forestry have 
members who also attended the forum. Um, the most important thing, of course, if what we do are transparent, uh, people will trust in us and also uh, there is check and balance of what the government is doing you know, so to ensure, to ensure sustainability. So <clears throat> the importance of participation of civil societies in policy advocacy and forest monitoring progress, especially in the FLEGT, BPA, and REBB plus development and the implementation with regional international approach is a new partnership across Asia Pacific. I believe that the forest government forum has provided a platform, space and voice for non-state actors, which will help to make different for the coming decades and uh, sustaining change and maintaining the momentum to meet the challenges for better forest government. Finally, I would like to congratulate BirdLife International and project partners, CIDT, MNAs, Burong Indonesia, Hebron Foundation, TCA and UPNG for successfully organizing this first Asia Pacific government Forest Government Forum. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic has a devastating impact. We have not seen tourism in Sarawak for almost two years. <laughs> and uh, people like us have to work from home sometime. Uh, we do have meetings like this, but it is all very much visual. We are lucky today we have this sort of uh, technology to be able to enable us to continue to communicate. And uh, with that, I would like to say, keep safe, stay well, and declare the Asia Pacific Forest Government Forum across. Thank you very much. Have a good day, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much there, Bracken, and, and, and very wise words uh, and collaborative words uh, at the end there in terms of transparency, sustainability, us all working together. And it's been a pleasure working with you and to have you um, share those, those final remarks uh, and, and close, close the session and the forum today for us. So thank you very much. And to all the panelists and everybody who's been involved in this last session from me. So I'm just going to, uh, all it remains is for me to hand you over to Richard for some, some final wrapping up um, and some final remarks from, from CIDT. Uh, thank you very much from us at BirdLife um, for being part of this forum. And we, we'll, we'll definitely continue these conversations and take them forward. It's been um, absolutely brilliant to, to, to be part of this in the last four days. So thank you all again for joining us. And over to you, Richard. Yes, uh, thank, <laughs> thank you very much, Noel. And uh, thank you very much, Yum. Uh, wow, 10 hours, 650 people. Uh, that's a, a huge uh, achievement. I think at CIDT, we are very grateful of this uh, partnership that we have with BirdLife International. Uh, it has really been an interesting one and uh, we have enjoyed our work in the Asia Pacific region. And we certainly hope uh, we have uh, another opportunity again, not just to work with BirdLife International, but also to work with the wonderful organizations that are doing fantastic work in that uh, uh, part of the world. Uh, unfortunately, I also need to say a few thank yous uh, for uh, colleagues at CIDT and also colleagues at BirdLife uh, who have been working uh, a lot behind the scenes, not just over the past four days, but also over the past sort of several weeks, uh, probably uh, 18 months or so. So firstly, I'd like to say uh, thank you to Habiba, Dani, Russell and Nicole, who have been behind the scenes uh, sort of working tirelessly to make this event a success. Uh, obviously, I also want to thank the interpreters. Uh, they have enabled us to uh, reach a wider audience with their fantastic work in uh, providing interpretation. The session chairs did a fantastic job, but most importantly, this event would not have been possible uh, with the presenters that have come from all over the world, uh, bringing in sort of fantastic experience uh, and sharing a very good example of the wonderful work that is going on around the world. I also want to make specific mention to some colleagues at Bed Life International, uh, Poshendra, uh, Jonathan, and also colleagues at Burung, uh, because initially we wanted to do uh, this event in Indonesia. So we've been discussing with them, working with them closely uh, over the last 18 months or so. So thank you very much, Poshendra, Jonathan, and also Hume and uh, Noel as well. Uh, but lastly, I want to thank the, the participants of, of all the people that have joined in to listen in and to participate uh, in this event. Uh, it has been wonderful. Uh, the engagement has been very positive. 
and a lot of people have given us uh, uh, good messages of encouragement. So we appreciate uh, you spending your time, uh, 10 hours uh, listening to all these presentations. Uh, thank you very much for joining in, uh, Trima Kasi. Uh, yeah, just to finish off, uh, uh, I would like to remind you and urge you uh, to fill in the evaluation form. Uh, it will be sent to all uh, participants by email, but it is also available in the chat box. Please give us your feedback. It is very useful and we very much appreciate it. It's the only way we can improve uh, these events in the future. Uh, lastly, uh, all the slides will be available on our website and we also uh, will make arrangements for them to be available on the Bed Life website as well. So if you have missed uh, any of the sessions, uh, the slides and everything will be available on our website.